are listening to Next Level Thinking on St. Martin Gov Radio 107.9. Welcome back, listeners, to Next Level Thinking. I'm your host, Stephanie Hassett, and I have Caroline and Sana with me here today. Uh, for those who are just tuning in, we are discussing daily frustrations today, something we experience all the time, every day, right? Before the break, uh, we discussed what frustration is and the effects that it has on us. And we also started a little bit with how everyone deals with frustration, that um, we, we were talking about complaining, right? Yeah, not to complain. I kind of want to go back to complaining for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because, you know, complaining is something that happens a lot and uh, that we tend to do quite easily. But does it really help? What do you think? Well, I think it helps in a way because you, ha- you have that frustration and you need to let go of that tension. And, mm-hmm. and complaining sometimes can feel like, you know, relief. Exactly. And instead of releasing the dragon on someone who doesn't deserve it, complaining sometimes help relieve that pressure Yeah. so that you don't get upset with those who don't really deserve it. Sometimes you you complain to other people. Mm-hmm. You know, you're doing this wrong and That's I expected true. this from you. That's blah, true. Blah, blah. Right. So then you do focus it on other people. Kind of. Then they still get that wrath. <laughs> is, is feedback complaining or complaining feedback? That's that's a difficult one because sometimes you got to tell somebody that you're not satisfied with, with the work they've done before, for example. So well, positive criticism, I guess, is different than complaining. Complaining is more of the the dragging, everything is wrong, it's all bad, it's terrible. So there is maybe, there are different types of complaining, I think. You have the chronic complainer, you know, every, some some person who find everything negative, the negative right. person. Um, how do you see the glass of water when it's half full? Is it like almost empty? Is it half full? I guess you see it half full. Or do you see the dragon inside of it? (laughs) (laughs) Um, But in that sense, um, yeah, you have the chronic complainer, you have the the, the, the venting. That's what we talked about before, you know, that that releases some of the stress. So that could be a helpful thing. Okay. Um, But if you do it too much, it also, you know, our brain is wired like that, that if you complain a lot, it kind of gives those negative sparks and you kind of can get addicted to that kind of feeling. And how can, how can you can get addicted to Addicted to negativity. It can feel comfortable to, to wallow yourself in, in that kind of feeling. And that also has to do a lot with your locus of control. Okay. Um, if you put everything outside of yourself, it's always the, the fault of that other person. It's always the fault of the weather. It's always the fault of that pothole that always is there when you cross that street. You know, it's not your fault. So it's also easy in a way. If you if, it, if it's not your fault, you don't have to change anything. You can just continue your day. Exactly. But no, because you will feel miserable because yeah. you will feel helplessness. But in that sense, you don't have to focus on yourself. So it, it, will, it will give you a relief in a short moment, but on the long run, it will only put you down. So by externalizing everything, by putting it outside of yourself, you kind of give up that control, what you're saying. So exactly. Now you cannot do anything about it because you're blaming everything else and others for it. So you you give away that control and now you're complaining that you don't have control and that everything is the way that it is. You know, we call that in psychology external attribution. Wow, okay. Nice term, huh? But it's it's says about externalizing and putting things outside of yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you have that tendency to do that more than indeed, um, there's a bigger chance of depression or um, yeah, low self-esteem or those kind of feelings. Frustration. Complaining. Oh, that leading to complaining. Leading yeah, but in that sense, you also have positive complaining. We're now focusing on the negative part, but you also have people who do it more instrumental uh, because sometimes you have to complain, right? You have to say something. If your partner uses the overmax the credit card, you have to complain like, honey, you know, it's not, that was not the deal. And you got to say something, but then you're focused on changing that part and then it can work. Um, if you don't wallow in it and don't only and use that kind of technique, then it might be useful. So sometimes you need to complain on life or vent for a moment to release that stress. So it doesn't have to be negative all the time. So and for some people, I also think that they feel like complaining, they need to complain to be heard. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. If you're not complaining, you're not a problem. And only if you're a problem to someone that someone wants to get rid of that problem is going to help you. So it can also be a way of getting attention, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. Making mm-hmm. yourself heard. Yeah, okay. but then everyone will react with, when you have frustration in a different way. But some people seem to react very quickly when they're frustrated and some people can just continue 
their job. Yeah, what does that depend on? Why is it the case that some people exactly get frustrated, certain things happen, and they're able to breathe in, breathe out, and continue, and others get immediately the, Yeah, they unleash, off. they unleash the dragon. They unleash the dragon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Caroline, you spoke about that before, uh, that bucket, the bucket being full, and when the bucket overflows. And I think it has something to do with that. Because do we have? Do we all have the same type of bucket? Big bucket, small bucket? Um, no, it's, it's something internally, of course, <laughs> that everybody has inside. It's a metaphor, um, but indeed, not not everybody's bucket is um, the same size, and that depends on what you're born with, your DNA, mm-hmm. uh, what kind of emotional tolerance or uh, what kind of sensitivity do you have, and that is in our genes, partly. So my bucket might be able to not hold as much as your bucket. Yeah. And it also depends on the life experience that you went through. What right. kind of tools your parent taught you to deal with frustration or your teachers or your friends. Yeah. And in psychology, we also call that bucket the window of tolerance. If you Google it, you're going to find a lot of information about that. But I'll gonna, I'm going to give you some information right now in this uh, radio show. Um, the window of tolerance, It's you can see it as a bucket. So you have big buckets and you have small buckets. And the window of tolerance says when your stress level is within that window of tolerance, you can tolerate the stress. That's why they call it a window of tolerance. And when your stress level, I think your stress level has a, has a baseline level. It's, I think it's never zero. Do you think it's... No, we can have never zero? no stress. No, there's always a certain amount of stress. And we need that stress, right? I think we talked about that in season one also, that we sometimes need a certain amount of stress to get going. Right, and we always already are carrying certain things in our bucket. There's yeah. always something yeah. there already. Yeah, always yeah. an empty bucket is not, you know. Why would be you carrying an feasible. empty bucket? Yeah. No, I mean, when you wake up, you have your appointments of the day. That is stress in itself. What time do I have to be there? What's the traffic going to be like? What do I have to do? Your targets of the day. Uh, I have to do the dishes still because exactly. my other half forgot. Didn't do them last night. Yeah. Um, and the Let's groceries. not go back to that part. <laughs> Your stress level is going up, right? Yeah, so it's going up in your window of tolerance. I'm starting to feel the complaining mode. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that is still in your window of tolerance. So because within your window of tolerance, you can tolerate the stress, you can still think about it. Right. Um, We use our human brain, our rational thinking. You think, okay, so this is a problem. Uh, What did I do before? What helped? What did not help? Uh, Can I ask someone for help? Um, all those kind of thoughts can help you to deal with that stress and tolerate the stress. So it's inside your window of tolerance. But when your stress level is rising, it goes outside of your window of tolerance. When it becomes too much, you mean? Yeah. So the bucket overflows? Indeed. It's that one last drip and your bucket overflows. So what do you do then? You can't make use of your hu- human brain anymore. You can't use that rational thinking it's it had to flip your lid. What you spoke about, uh, Stephanie. Yeah, it becomes a tsunami in the bucket. Exactly. Yeah, or outside the bucket. Outside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it overflows. It overflows. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. So if we can't use that rational thinking anymore, uh, our body, our brain is signaling danger. We need to react. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't have any time to think about that. So there are just a few reactions that we can give, and it's fight, flight, or Freeze. Freeze, yes, indeed. And that is not th- something that you you choose. You don't choose to do one of those. So fight is the dragon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fight is the dragon, indeed. <laughs> right. Indeed. Yeah. When it just bubbles up and it, it has to come out. Yeah. It overflows and there is the anger, the frustration, the agitation. Yeah. And you lash out at someone. Indeed, yeah. indeed. And when we can't make use of a human brain, what are we going to make use of then? That's the mammal brain. The fight or flight response, the mammal brain. So think of... Oh, uh, was that the amygdala, what we talked about before? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, the amygdala sends out a signal. It's preparing your body to fight or to flight. So you feel all those uh, physical sensations, right? Um, The mammal brain, think uh, an an example. Uh, What if a a small, beautiful deer, let's call the deer Bambi. (laughs) Was Bambi a a he or a she? I think Bambi was a he, you know. Not a she? No, Bambi was a he. Okay. A he. Okay. Okay. So imagine Bambi grazing, nice green, fresh grass, sunny day. And then suddenly we have a lion. 
Oh gosh, I don't like this story. <laughs> no, no, that's where these stories go, huh? <laughs> right. But they usually always heart. have a happy ending, uh, luckily, the Disney stories. Bambi. <laughs> but, um, okay, so we have Bambi, we have that lion. Bambi is not gonna seek for a place in the shade and think about, hmm, what did I do last time? What can I do this time? Who can I ask for help? What is Bambi gonna do? Fight the lion? I think... Why Bambi's instinct is not to fight because somewhere Bambi knows it's weaker than the lion. Yeah. So it will probably flight. Right. Depends on what kind of Bambi. If it was like super Bambi. Super Bambi, she might fight. <laughs> she oh, might she, have a little, she, yeah. he might have a little <laughs> dragon in him. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Who or knows? Um, Bambi might just freeze out of like just fear. Yeah. yeah. Maybe hoping that the lion won't see her anymore because there's a statue of Bambi there, yeah. not a real Bambi. Exactly. I don't know. True. Okay, so if you fight or if you flight, that is our hyper arousal. Mm -hmm. You know, we are in full action mode. Our amygdala sends those signals to your body being prepared to fight or to flight. Um, but we also spoke about the freeze reaction and the freeze reaction is a hypo arousal. So it's like you're, you're shutting down Um, and in that, that shutting down mode, you make use of your reptile brain. And your reptile brain is just regulating your heart rhythm, your blood pressure, your breathing, just to stay alive. So fight, flight, and fr uh, freeze are all survival modes, actually. Okay. And your body is just doing it. It's not a, not a choice. So you that's mean. why we respond in a certain way when we get frustrated. Yeah. Not just frustrated, what I'm understanding correctly, when it gets too much for us. Yeah, when it actually can lead to aggression. Right. Example. When we get overwhelmed, our bucket overflows, we can't handle it anymore. So our brain shuts off and we go into survival mode, which is either with our mammal brain or our reptilian brain, where we go into either, okay, just the basic functions of emotions work and our body gets ready or completely go down into our freeze mode where We can only breathe and just stand there, just be there. So I understand that not always when our frustration gets the better of us, we can control our, our responses, which makes it difficult sometimes, which makes us snap at, at other people at times. Okay. So we discussed this, this segment, what the biology actually behind um, frustration and behind our response towards frustration, right? So it teaches us that some people can handle a little bit more stress than others and can handle a little bit more difficulties in, in life than others um, because their window of tolerance is shaped differently. There's different tools in their, in their, in their, uh, in their bucket uh, that they can use when, uh, when frustration or when stresses hit. After the break, we'll discuss some more about frustration and what we can actually do with it because now we discussed you know, what happens when we can't control it. But what can we do to control it? So, uh, stay tuned. Next Level Thinking